I think that this year has really shown that everybody in supply chain are heroes. And I think sourcing hero just sort of covers that, right? I mean, you're talking about sourcing, I get it. But I think every bit of supply chain, especially this year, have stepped up to the plate. They've been heroes in various different ways. And I think that that's what a hero really is. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Sourcing Hero podcast. I'm your host, Catherine. And today on this beautiful November day, before we head into the holiday season, I've got a special guest, Sarah Barnes Humphrey. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, you and I were talking at the beginning or before we even started recording this about how we met just over a year ago. And it's so awesome to see that you guys have your own podcast. Thank you. You were an inspiration for sure. A lot of people in procurement and just the podcast that I'm a huge fan of outside of procurement. And I told you before, I have a little bit of a background in broadcasting. And so it's kind of been a secret passion of mine to get back into it. And I just had to get a few things out of the way this year before I jumped in, but I'm so glad that we did. And to be very honest, it has really broadened my knowledge base of supply chain and procurement. So great addition to the brand. And it's really cool to have you on this side of the microphone as opposed to how we started out a year ago. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, that's a lot of fun. And that's something that I've been getting a little bit more used to in 2020 as well, because I'm so used to being on the other side of the mic. But now I do enjoy being on this side as well, because like you, I'm learning a ton through Let's Talk Supply Chain as well. And so it's really good to be able to pass on that knowledge. Yes. And speaking of Let's Talk Supply Chain, that was going to be a part of your introduction here. So if, you know, for those of you that aren't familiar with Sarah Barnes Humphrey, I'm sure that you are. She's the host of Let's Talk Supply Chain. She's the founder of Ships. She's got another show called Blended. What else am I missing, Sarah? I know you're a busy woman. Well, I mean, that pretty much sums it up, although Let's Talk Supply Chain has a few different series underneath it. So we've got the Woman in Supply Chain series. We've got the new series, the new diversity and inclusion series called Blended, which I'm sure we're going to be talking about a little bit later on in the discussion. Founder of Ships and yeah, just really busy with two startups because essentially they're two different startups and having fun within the community, creating content, creating value, hearing from the community. So just lots of things going on. Yeah. So I've seen over the last year since we've started Let's Talk Supply Chain show, it seemed like it just kind of exploded and I kept on seeing more and more episodes. How many of those a month are you doing? I am doing nine episodes a month. So we have our regular episode that comes out every Monday. And now we are doing mini series for other supply chain companies, other people in supply chain that want to have their own podcast, but don't want everything that goes along with it. So we're doing four part mini series. And then I'm doing uh, one blended episode a month as well. That's exciting. There's a lot to talk about this year. There absolutely is. I mean, I don't even know how we're going to impact all of this in one episode, but we're definitely going to try. I know it. And for those of you listening, by the way, this episode is going to be a little bit different, although we will get back to the original Sourcing Hero theme as we get through this episode. But I wanted to bring Sarah on the show because she has such a strong point of view. She speaks her mind. She has a supply chain point of view that we don't normally get on the show. A lot of our guests are procurement practitioners or procurement software founders. And so I knew that she'd have a really great perspective to add. So let's get into it. Let's talk about this train wreck of a year, 2020. I've got a few questions to ask you, but I was hoping that you could share with our audience something that surprised you this year. I know obviously the pandemic was surprising for everybody, but beyond that, within supply chain, what caught your attention? I would say what caught my attention was the people. I've really seen a lot within this community, supply chain, procurement, people really supporting each other, rallying around each other. I think one of the most surprising things is probably the collaborative nature between competitors even, between suppliers and buyers to make sure that everybody sort of weathers the storm as much as they possibly can. 
But from a people perspective, I mean, we've seen resiliency, we've seen them overcome adversity, and I think we've really shone a light on supply chain. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've never heard the word supply chain, logistics, procurement out of our leaders' mouths as much as we have this year. And one of the fun stories, I guess, is Daniel Stanton. I don't know if everybody is familiar with him, but he was on Dr. Oz talking about supply chain and talking about the food supply chain, especially how we couldn't get some of the food from the farmers into the hands of the people that needed it. And so that was a little bit of a fun story, you know, like you're watching Dr. Oz and there we are, you know, shining a light on supply chain. So Lots of surprising things, but I would really say the people. I started a buddy check on LinkedIn last March when everything really started to shut down and people were really starting to understand what it meant for us as not only professionals, but also in our personal life and really juggling so, so much. And so I think mental health has really been at the forefront of a lot of our leaders' conversations with their teams being more intentional about mental health, checking in with people has been really important this year as well. And do you think that's going to carry over into the next couple of years? Yeah, I would absolutely hope so. I mean, if we've, they say that what it takes 30 days to establish a habit and we've had what, six months. <laughs> so I really hope that the empathy that we've seen this year, the intentional check-ins, the conversations around mental health, having flexibility for our teams as far as what they're dealing with. I just hope that would. I mean, I, we've kind of established that habit so that I hope that it would translate into 21. And I mean, think about it. We're not really out of the woods. Like, it's not like right. we're going to go from December 31st into January 1st and a light switch is going to be pressed and everything's going to change. I mean, so I don't know if everybody knows this, but I'm just outside of Toronto. And so our prime minister has said everybody should have the vaccine by September. That's still 10 months away. Yeah. And even once we've got that, you know, how much trial and error is there going to be opening and closing and second and third round of the vaccine? And the one thing I'm hoping that carries through, not that mental health isn't as important as anything else in those buddy checks that you're talking about. I'm hoping that the collaboration between buyers and sellers, I'm hoping that that new atmosphere just continues to get better. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with you on that. And I really hope to see that because, I mean, if anybody knows me and they listen to the show, they know that my favorite saying is collaboration is the future of business. And if anything, in 2020, I mean, that's what we've seen. We've seen people weather the storm, come together, collaborate and really provide win-win scenarios. Right. Yeah. Especially when we couldn't get the supplies across the world and people locally had to figure out how are we going to source everything. Yeah. I remember hearing so many cool stories about companies working together on that. So as far as supply chain is concerned, through the pandemic, there were plenty of things to be upset about. There's a lot that didn't go right. Tell me about a big win that you saw for supply chain this year? I would go back to collaboration because I think that's a huge one. I also think that there are some huge wins on the technology front. I mean, if we think about it, this pandemic, a lot of people really were able to take the technology that were on the back shelf or the back burner and really bring it to light because now was the time that we really needed to take a look at our processes. We really needed to take a look at our data houses and what we're using data for, how we're using it, or maybe we're not using it and we need to use it. And so I think technology was a really big win and moving forward in technology within supply chain was a really big win. I think the other one is work from home. I mean, at the end of the day, when we talk about supply chain or at least logistics, we're talking about a very traditional environment. And I can tell you only two years ago, I was talking to somebody and they were like, absolutely not. People are not allowed or we cannot have people working from home. We need them in the office and they need to be working together. And working from home, it's a disaster and it will never work. Well, a lot of the supply chain leaders that I'm talking to haven't seen productivity levels like they have this year. I was just talking to a leader today and he was saying that it's brought his team closer together. 
And I think as we look into 2021 as to what's going to happen with the work from home and a lot of the conversations that I've had with leaders is that we're not going to be going back to a five day in office work week. We're going to be looking at more hybrid models. Not everybody needs to be in the office all the time. Maybe it's two days a week. Maybe it's three days a week in the office. The other two, the other three days are work from home. Everybody's got a hybrid schedule. We take a look. We're a little bit more flexible as to what people can do and how they're doing it to make them more productive. Because if anything, that's what this year has really highlighted. Yeah. Isn't it crazy to think about You know, and I've worked for companies that were so staunch about not working from home and like that's not allowed and you've got to have eight hours in the office. It's silly to me. It's like, okay, we're all adults. We're all trying to earn a paycheck. Of course, we're going to put in the time and get our work done. And like you said, even more so now that we're working from home, I don't have a commute to worry about. I don't have, you know, cook lunch upstairs and get all my work done. I know I definitely work more hours now than I used to for sure. Yeah. And I think the other thing that we don't quite realize, I was talking to a friend of mine that does the commute. He lives in Panama and he used to do the commute and he did it for a number of years from the city into Cologne. And it's an hour drive each way. And then the pandemic hit and they had to work from home and they couldn't go out of the home and they had to, he no longer had the commute. Well, now he's gone back to the commute and he's like, I am exhausted. Because the stamina that he had built up for that commute that he had, that two-hour commute a day, has now gone out the window. And now we have to sort of retrain ourselves to get back into what that day-to-day is really going to look like. And I think as leaders, we're also going to have to take that into account if we are going to ask them to come back into the office, that people are going to have to get used to it again. So how many people in your network are back in their offices? You know what? I don't actually know too much. I know that there were, you know, most people that I'm talking to are working from home. A lot of people that I'm talking to in the U.S. are in the U.S. And most of them are working from home because of the staggering numbers that, I mean, your numbers are really, really high still over there. In Canada, I think there's more people in the office than there is in the States. And then when I look at Australia, I mean, I've got a friend in Melbourne who went through that four month lockdown, and they've gone 28 days without cases. And so she's now back in the office. And then you look at the UK. So the UK had a lockdown, I think it's tomorrow that it gets lifted, and people can start going back into the offices. But there's a lot of companies that are saying, no, we're going to work from home until the end of 2021. Or and they're also saying that there's no travel until the end of 2021 as well. So companies are really starting to enforce and bring it into the end of 2021, what they're going to do as far as working from home and even travel. Yeah, necessities and efficiency and work, all of that has completely changed. And I've had jobs before and certainly our sales team before they were traveling on a monthly basis, the job I had before this, there were people that were just traveling 80% of their job. And now they're doing everything through Zoom. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to one of my former coworkers and I'm just like, so could you just do like your entire job remote and you don't even have to be hopping on a plane? And he's like, yeah, I mean, most of it, which brings me back to something you said earlier about being in the office and being around people. In my mind, like I miss that quite a bit. But you said something about someone you talked to who has become a closer team working from home. And I'd say I'm pretty close to my team as well. But I'm just wondering, remote teams and supply chain, how that's going to pan out. Do you really think that people need to go back into the office? Or do you think this is just that we're going to have to flex those communication skills remotely? I mean, listen, there's a few functions of supply chain that do need to go back or have not even left the office. I mean, let's think about distribution, right? Warehousing, people have been in the office a lot of the time. And I guess this episode is called Sourcing Heroes. We should also highlight some of the heroes of this year, which are the truckers who have kept products moving and kept products on our shelves and in our homes. You've got the warehouse people the people in the distribution facilities that have gone into work every single day and risked getting COVID and that kind of thing. And then you've also got the seafarers. So a lot of the things that we don't talk about 
in supply chain or even in procurement are the seafarers. And they're the ones that are on the vessels. And some of those seafarers have been on those vessels for upwards of 18 months without seeing their family. And they're the ones that actually move 90% of trade globally. That's a big number. Yeah, it's huge. And I wanted to bring it up today because obviously I love the name of your podcast, but it's also important to highlight that. And so your initial question is, can we survive working from home? Well, I think it depends on your role. I think it depends on what part of the supply chain that you're working in. Again, distribution, obviously not. You need to be on the ground and you need to be managing your teams. You need to be managing your warehouses. Obviously, truckers, they've still got to keep products moving. They are the ones that are going into warehouses on a day-to-day basis to pick up that product so we have the products on the shelves. I think other functions of supply chains, yeah, we absolutely could. I think that if there needs to be an in-person meeting, I think you can accommodate that, but it doesn't need to be every single day. I also think from a sales standpoint, though, so like you said, you miss being in the office, you miss that interaction. I think as a salesperson in supply chain, procurement, logistics, it's been a rough year, right? They're used to traveling. They're used to going to conferences. I mean... If you think about it, there's magic in networking, in-person networking. Yes, I agree. There's just so much magic. And so I think it's been a really, really tough year for salespeople in our industry. And I think for them, maybe not going back to work in the office, but I think going back to in-person conferences and going back to in-person networking is going to be a big thing as well. Yeah, I miss that. Networking is my second nature. (laughs) So not having the ability, you know, we had some conferences planned. There were definitely some procurement events that we were hoping to get to. And it's sad. We'll get back to it next year. It'll be just fine. I don't know about next year. I mean, hold on to your hat on that one, because a lot of companies, like I said, have put a hold on travel in 2021. And so how can you do in-person conferences when some of your biggest sponsors are not letting their people travel? I think the other thing that we have to think about too is the insurance on the events. True. And how do you figure out who's vaccinated, who's not vaccinated? Like, how are you managing that? Like, there's a lot to it. I think we'll get back to some live events, like sporting, maybe concerts, potentially. I think in-person conferences are going to take a little bit longer than you think, but I could be wrong. Yeah. You know, in conferences, I can wait on. I think that being able to visit top clients and yes, potential partners. I think that should probably return next year as people feel comfortable doing so. So I want to hop back. We talked about big wins for the industry. I want to hear about some big wins for you this year. All right, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a big year. I mean, we've taken a look at the pivot from in-person conferences and marketing being done that way and moving it digitally. And obviously, that's something that I do with Let's Talk Supply Chain and the content that we provide. So it's been a great year for that and for what we've been doing at Let's Talk Supply Chain. The other thing is really launching Blended. I mean, that show, that series was a six-month endeavor. I actually put it out on somebody's show. I can't remember whose show. And I was like, I am going to do a diversity and inclusion series. And then I was like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. And so people kept asking me, when is this coming out? When is this coming out? When is this coming out? I was like, guys, like I haven't even got my head wrapped around this idea. And so it took me about six months. And I wanted to take that time because I really wanted to make sure it was something that everybody resonated with. And it was different than just high level box checking, that kind of stuff. And so I was listening to what the community was talking about. I was watching what was happening with Black Lives Matter. And so I decided to bring five people from all walks of life together to talk about different diversity and inclusion topics. And so Blended is really something that's been a highlight of my year because the authenticity People are just genuine. They're sharing their stories. They're sharing the impact on their lives. We're talking through some of the stuff that, like, for example, on the first episode of Blended, we had somebody from the LGBTQIA plus community. And I said to him, I said, can I ask you how you identify? And he was like, well, it kind of depends on the scenario, et cetera, et cetera. I said, but 
Let's talk about this because you want me to know how you identify, but how am I going to know if I can't ask unless you're going around telling everybody, which you're not. Right. And so the whole group actually talked out the scenario. And by the end of the scenario, he said, no, you know what? Just ask me. Just ask me. Doesn't matter. Just ask me. And so that was a real eye opener. I think for a lot of people in the industry, it was a very big eye opener for me. And it really just elevates the communication within the diversity and inclusion topic. And then the other one for me is launching ships. This one's been a couple of years in the making. It's been a journey, let me tell you. But I really wanted to combine the journey that I've had, the career that I've had in logistics and what I've learned from working at a freight provider, freight forwarder, and what I learned in sales when I talked to a lot of importers and exporters. And So literally, I took all of my learnings from that, and I've moved it online. And so we're an online bid and ship marketplace for air and ocean freight. We launched that in September. And one of the highlights from ships is that I got a five letter domain. And the interesting story behind that is that I acquired it from a guy in Malta. Okay. Yeah, I knew we wanted that name. I knew we wanted that URL. So we contacted the guy in Malta, I talked him down. 75%. (laughs) Get it. There you go. And we were able to get that five letter domain. So we've done a few cute commercials on whether it's ships or ship Z, whether you're Canadian or American. I saw that. I love it. So if people are wanting to look into blended and ships, where should they go? Yeah. So go to letstalksupplychain.com. If you go to podcast, you can go to the category filter and you can search for blended. We're actually doing some website updates for 2021. So there's easier access to blended, but that's how you can find it for now. And then for ships, it's S-H-I-P-Z or Z.com. And that's where you can find some more information there or just connect with me on LinkedIn, Sarah Barnes Humphrey. I answer all the comments, all the mentions, all the messages because I love talking to the community. So make sure to connect with me. I'm so excited to go listen to that episode, the first one that you're talking, all of them, but especially that first episode of Blended. That sounds so interesting to me and honestly useful, useful information. I think the environment we're in right now is just begging for some of that realness and some education. Nobody wants to be referring to people the wrong way. And the best way to move forward is to make sure that you're educated. And that's, I mean, beyond the pandemic and beyond everything that's happened in 2020 for supply chain and procurement, the social injustice issues. I know that you had mentioned some of that is the topics are on the show. And so, yeah, it's totally excited to listen to that. It's totally relevant right now. And I'm getting off topic. I just wanted to make sure people knew where to find those two things for you. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. The next thing I wanted to ask you about was what people can expect in 2021. What do you envision for supply chain next year? That is a loaded question. I almost wish that I had a crystal ball every time I got this question asked to me. But I think we're going to see a supply chain highlighted even more. I mean, think about it. We've got this vaccine that needs to be distributed to 8 billion people globally. Right. And where is it being manufactured? I'm not actually entirely sure. I know that there's at least two or three manufacturers that are trying to get on the FDA list and to get it approved. But I don't know exactly where it's being manufactured. I do know that some of the logistical challenges are obviously going to be temperature control, because I think one of them has to be at a super crazy, really cold number to maintain its authenticity to be able to get it to people and get the vaccine through. I think the fact that people are talking about having one to two doses or one to three doses is also going to play a factor. And I think we're going to see what that actually means for all of our lives and how that new normal really is going to be. I mean, we've been talking about new normal this year, but really that's just a temporary new normal until we get the vaccine, we can get back sort of on track to what that new new normal actually really looks like. And I mean, I don't think at this point, anybody can really predict what that'll look like. But I do hope that obviously, we can go back to in person and seeing each other. I think we're going to be seeing a lot of hybrid models, like I was talking about the working from home versus going into the office. I think also, we're going to see hybrid models on the technology side, we're going to see hybrid models in supply chain as well. I think there's a lot of innovation and new innovation that's probably come out of this year 
based on what we've seen. Obviously, no toilet paper on the shelves was a problem. We don't want to run into that again. And are you guys not running into that right now in Toronto? No, we're not. I mean, we did have our paper manufacturer actually here in Canada had said that there was going to be a shortage, but we haven't as far as anything that I've seen on the news, we haven't really been seeing what we had seen previously. So I think, you know, we're going to see more diversification of suppliers rather than all eggs in one basket. We're going to see those eggs being spread out. I think there's going to be more talk about manufacturing for local markets rather than manufacturing for global markets. And what I mean by that is, you know, we were manufacturing out of China to produce products for the world. And now we're looking at Apple going into India. And one of the reasons Apple is going into India for manufacturing is not only that it gives them another option from a manufacturing standpoint, but it also opens up a huge market for them as far as a consumer facing market. And so different brands are looking at different ways. I think we're going to see a hybrid of people and technology. I think, especially in warehouses and distribution, I think we're going to be seeing some adoption of a lot of the technology that can really help make processes that much more efficient, but also work with people to have their innovation and their creativity and their strategy behind it. And so I know that's a lot to unpack, but that's really some of the predictions that I'm thinking that we're going to see in 2021. Yeah, I can definitely confirm for you on the manufacturing side a lot more local manufacturing instead of importing from China. My former employer, I used to work for a manufacturer before this job, manufacturer and outdoor plumbing products, prior products. Shout out to you guys. You're doing great. They have done a tremendous job of innovating on the actual manufacturing floor and creating some of their own machinery to make parts that they were, you know, normally shipping with the seafarers. So saving money, you know, and those things get passed down to customers and creating more efficient systems. So I think that's also, we could count that as a big win for supply chain as well this year. Yeah, I think we could too. I think that's a great point. Well, normally I ask this question at the very beginning, it's the opener, but we just got right into chatting about the year. And I said that this was going to be a slightly different episode, but I don't think that we can end this thing without asking your opinion and get your point of view on what the sourcing hero means to you. Hmm. You didn't give me very much time to think about that one. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, no. And I think when we first met and I was talking to Anthony about sourcing hero, I really, really like that sentiment. I think that this year has really shown that everybody in supply chain are heroes. And I think sourcing hero just sort of covers that right? I mean, you're talking about sourcing, I get it. But I think every bit of supply chain, especially this year, have stepped up to the plate. They've been heroes in various different ways. And I think that that's what a hero really is. I mean, some people have made a difference closer to them, maybe at home, maybe at their immediate teams. Some people have made more of an impact, maybe online, maybe through LinkedIn. Some people have made impacts globally by bringing people together on a global scale to help them get through this pandemic. And so I think hero definitely just means different things to different people. And I think that it just needs to start with you and you just need to do something. Yeah, it seems like everybody that I ask, I try to bring on a variety of people within supply chain sourcing and procurement. I love having different perspectives because everybody's answer tends to be pretty specific to their environment and what they do. But it always draws back to a way to add value, to give value to someone else or to an organization. And I love that because I think that's the heart of the people that you and I work with, whatever the capacity is within the industry. These people are doing above and beyond what they're asked of right now. And it's the world is getting to see that. And I think that's one of the natural traits of a lot of people in procurement and supply chain. And so I think that's really cool. And people have told me that they love that they're being referred to as sourcing heroes or just, you know, heroes within their industry and that we need more of it. We need to call each other out 
and lift everybody up. So that's kind of the point of the show. Yeah, we absolutely do. And I love that. And I think to summarize, I guess what I was saying is just start where you can impact. Right. And I know that's what you're doing. So that's great advice for everyone else. But like I said before, I can't wait to get into the blended show and see what else that you've got cooking for next year. Anything else that you want to tell us that's going on with you and your group of businesses? Not yet. I will be willing to reveal a few things within Q1 of some of the stuff that I have been working on. But look out for a new website because we are not a new website, but we're updating the Let's Talk Supply Chain website a little bit. And I've got an amazing team. I guess one other thing that I really should or I really want to just share is just a shout out and a thank you to my team of amazing individuals. We also launched TikTok this year back in October. And we, we did that to bridge the gap between supply chain management students and what the corporations are looking for from the supply chain management students so they can better understand what they're learning, what their experiences are, what they need from our community to be able to start off their career. And so we're looking to bridge the gap with TikTok. And it's been a lot of fun so far. So look out for more blended, look out for more TikTok. Look out for some more amazing episodes and mini series that we've got going on. And then I've got some other stuff up my sleeve that I'll let everybody else know in Q1. Of course, you've got more coming. Such a creative person. And uh, it sounds like your team has been contributing quite a bit as well. Thank you so much for sharing your insight, sharing your point of view, and for just hanging out with me today. It's been a fun conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I always enjoy talking with you and Anthony and the team over at and so I just, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. Good to talk to you. And I'm sure there will be a next time. There's going to be episodes to plan for next year. Awesome. 